Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you here to Family Research Council. My name is Bethany Demin, and I'm the Student Interns and Lectures Coordinator here. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Congressman Trent Franks here today. Uh, I actually won't be doing his introduction, but I am here to do just a couple of housekeeping items. I uh, just want to welcome you and also welcome our online viewers. We're glad you're with us. Just a reminder to everyone, we do film and archive all of our lectures, and those are all on our website. So please do uh, share the link on your social media after you leave here today. We really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to welcome to the podium at this time David Christensen, who is VP of Government Affairs here at FRC, and he will introduce our guest speaker. Uh, greetings. Um, I'm David Christensen, Vice President of Government Affairs, Family Research Council. Welcome. Uh, thank you for being here. And I think the timing could not be uh, more impressive with what's going on uh, in the public debate over um, abortion and life and what Congress's responsibility is in that. And to introduce Congressman Trent Franks um, to you is a real honor. He is a conservative Reagan Republican who hails from uh, the 8th District in Arizona, serving in his seventh term in the United States Congress. He serves on the House Judiciary Committee and the House Armed Services Committee. And uh, this, I have to read this because he's uh, impressive in terms of the kinds of issues that he cares about. He's the co-chair of the Orphans and Vulnerable Children Caucus, the Congressional Caucus on Adoption, the International Religious Freedom Caucus. He is a staunch advocate of Israel. He serves as the co-chairman of the Congressional Israel Allies Caucus. Prior to his time in Congress, he served in the Arizona legislature working on the protections for families and children. He founded and served as the executive director of the Arizona Family um, Research Institute, advocating for public policies to protect children, families in Arizona. Congressman Franks is a former small business owner and his wife, um, Josie, is that how I say your wife's name? Uh, worked as a Sunday school teacher, uh, both of them as Sunday school teachers um, for preschool, preschoolers for uh, 22 years. Um, they are parents of two uh, precious children. I've gotten to meet uh, seven-year-old uh, Joshua Lane and he also has um, a twin sister, Emily Grace. Uh, Congressman Franks is a, a champion on many issues, uh, n not the least of which is the protection of uh, the unborn. He is the sponsor of H.R. 36, the Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Act, which passed uh, by a large margin in the House of Representatives um, on May 13th, 242 votes to 184 votes. And uh, I should add that I understand that uh, Leader McConnell in the Senate has announced that Tuesday the Senate will be having a vote on a ban on um, uh, 20 week old or older unborn children. He is also the sponsor, and this really fits in, in a timely way, to a bill that he defended in Rules Committee last night um, to essentially provide criminal penalties and enforcement of the Born Alive Infant Protection Act. His bill is H.R. 3504. Uh, it is being debated in uh, the floor in the rules today and will be voted on in the House tomorrow. And that is called the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act. Uh, without further ado, Congressman Franks. Well, thank, thank you, David, and, and thank all of you for being here. You know, I am a little bit embarrassed that they might call this a lecture because that's for, you know, the PhDs and the people a lot smarter than I am. Uh, I'm just kind of an old roughneck that came out of the oil fields and stumbled onto the floor of the House of Representatives and really don't know how it happened. But I am grateful to be here. And um, as you know, a life is so challenging for us sometimes that it's hard to really pull together the most compelling kind of presentation and so I'm going to, if I can, just get pretty raw with you here today and talk about what is happening and also hope that we can uh, elaborate into some questions here pretty quickly. Let me first say that I believe that Family Research Institute is the gold standard uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's interesting that when he mentioned about the Arizona Family Research Institute, a long time ago this was called the Family Research Council, and it was headed up by a guy by the name of Jerry Regeer. I'm dating myself. There's a lot of gray in my temples. Uh, but uh, Jerry Regeer uh, was a great champion for the cause here, and we sort of modeled our state organization, which was associated with Focus on the Family, after this organization. 
uh, a long time ago. And then it grew and it sort of became associated with focus and then de-associated. And now it stands on its own as, I believe, the premier uh, pro-family, the comprehensive conservative pro-family organization in America. So I just can't tell you uh, how deeply I endorse all of you. You know, I, I hope you know that. It's not just a, sometimes politicians want you to endorse them. I, I just want you to know I endorse you, and I'm just grateful you're here. And I got one special guest, if I can, introduce. Now, I have to be careful because I told you a lot of gray in my temples, but I have seven-year-old children. My wife and I have been married 35 years, and we have the first and only children, uh, twins, seven years old. And I got one of them with me back here. His name is Joshua. Say hello to the folks, Josh. <laughs> and he's... He's my, he's my little fella. He's my buddy boy. He's my guy. He loves my boy. And so I'm so thankful. He's with his dad, just the two of us. We're batching it here in Washington, D.C., and it's pretty awesome. Uh, so it's just been really wonderful. And I just thank God for him. And if I talk about my children too much, I get a little emotional because I will tell you, folks, nothing God gives us on this planet uh, is more precious and has more hope and more indicative of the purpose and the gift of life than, than our children. I mean, they're, they're our only link to the future. Uh, they are the only things we can take to heaven with us. Uh, they are really the, the focus of it all. And I think that sometimes we forget that real statesmanship, I mean, you've heard it many times that, uh, you know, a politician looks to the next election, whereas a statesman looks to the next generation. But God help us uh, in everything that we do in debate to remember that uh, the impact will be most significantly felt by the generations to come. And you and I, all of us, have the wonderful privilege of sitting here because many men died in darkness so that we could live in the light of this freedom. And uh, we're very blessed people, and I hope that we can somehow take a little measure of their devotion from the past and, and uh, <clears throat> expound on it here in this generation so that future generations can sit here and that this republic will remain intact because I'm convinced that what's happening now in America is going to be very impactful on whether or not we will survive as a republic. I'm very convinced of that. I wish I, I, wish I weren't. I'm convinced that the next presidential election has the most profound of implications. I have the privilege of chairing the, the Constitution subcommittee and work very hard to get there, primarily because that's where most of the pro-life legislation bottlenecks through. That's where it really happens. And even though I care about many issues, I'm convinced that the entire purpose and core reason for government is to protect the innocent, to protect the rights of those who can't protect themselves. That's, why, that's the whole concept of government. We wouldn't need government if it weren't for that. If we are of this notion that the survival of the fittest is the equation, well, then we just have to step back and forget about it. Just let it happen. But because we believe that there are certain truths that, you know, that we're all created, that means each person has inestimable worth and that we need to protect each person. But some of those people can't protect themselves. So collectively, we've said, all right, we're going to join forces and we're going to protect everybody. That's the purpose of government. Our founding fathers had it right, <clears throat> and yet so many people... Today, if you talk about protecting the unborn, they say, oh, well, we need to talk about important issues. Here you are talking about this issue that's been with us so long, and it really starts to, to rag on me a little bit because they don't remember that the whole purpose we have a national security apparatus is to protect the innocent, to protect the rights of people. The whole reason we have an economic mechanism is to provide and protect uh, people's lives. The whole reason we have a social policy, a constitution, is to, is to protect the innocent. God help us. How do we not? How do we forget that so easily? How do we let the left drag us off into some ancillary issue that really doesn't matter a whole lot and forget the foundation and purpose of it all? So with that, uh, I think that these videos by Planned Parenthood have pulled this veil back, as, as Tony has liked to say so many times, and shown America what happens to the victims of Planned Parenthood behind those walls. And uh, we should all remind ourselves that what is happening to are, are the least of these our little brothers and sisters. And sometimes I, I don't know when I really let myself focus on the reality of it all, <clears throat> it almost seems overwhelming. You almost think, how in God's name did we get here? But we did. And people say, well, we're at a crossroads now. No. No, we were at a crossroads years ago. We were at a crossroads when Barack Obama ran for election the first time. 
and we took the wrong road. And now we are down a very dark, crumbling uh, highway, and I don't know where it leads to, but if we don't claw our way back onto the right path, uh, our children will not see the kind of freedom that we have. Being on the, the chairman of the Constitution Subcommittee, I'm reminded that the Supreme Court, we've now vested them essentially with every element of constitutional interpretation, which is a terrible mistake. I swore to up, uphold and defend the Constitution to support and defend the Constitution myself, not if the Supreme Court said it was okay. Uh, that was my, not my oath. My oath was to do it the best I could in our own constitutional place. And unfortunately, that perspective hasn't prevailed. And now we put so much in them. So now we have four people on the Supreme Court that truly respect and revere the Constitution. We've got four on it that revile the Constitution. And we've got one guy that has a hard time knowing which way north is. Uh, you know? And so consequently, the Republic hangs with the thinnest and most delicate of threads. And we didn't get there by the uh, recent, the, the, the Supreme Court. We didn't convince, what, where we lost that was in years past in presidential elections. And the next president will appoint two, <clears throat> maybe three justices. And if we do not win the next presidency, uh, I believe the Constitution will be lost for decades, maybe forever. Uh, the guy that held my position years ago, a guy named Daniel Webster, said it so well. He said, hold on, my friends, to the Constitution and to the republic for which it stands, for miracles do not cluster. And what has happened once in 6,000 years may never happen again. So hold on to the Constitution, for if the American Constitution should fall, there will be anarchy throughout the world. Wow. He's never been more right. He's been dead a long time, but he's more right today than he was when he said it. So that's our challenge right now. Now let me suggest to you that I believe we have a unique opportunity in protecting the unborn because um, the truth is a powerful thing. I think it was, was St. Augustine said, the truth is like a lion. You don't need to defend it. Just let it loose. It will defend itself. Powerful stuff. And we've now got some truth out there circulating among the natives. And the big challenge is, is getting them all to see the videos. Because I saw polling data this morning. Among those that had seen the videos, there was some serious change of heart. But among those who hadn't, uh, there wasn't such a change. Now, my, my conviction is that probably more of the, more of the pro-life people, you know, that were interested in protecting the unborn saw it. So maybe the, the poll is skewed a little bit. But it's fairly dramatic. And we need to try to make sure on our social networks and things like that that we get these videos in the minds of people because the truth is a powerful thing. Once people see it, you can't hide it from them anymore. And that indeed is our great challenge because all through the ages, when people saw the humanity of the victim and the inhumanity of what was being done to them, their hearts changed. We have to hope that happens now. Now, I know that we live in a different society than we used to, and somebody said, I, I won't try to quote him exactly because it's pretty scary what he said. But he said, for instance, Barack Obama is not the problem. It's the consortium of fools that would have such a man for president that is the problem. And as a people, we've got to wake up and do what's necessary to win elections. Because if you forget everything else I've said today, there's only two ways to change policy in America. Only two. We can elect the right people or we can beg the wrong ones to do the right thing. That's where we are. We have to, as a, a movement, as a people of faith, as people committed to freedom, as people committed to life, we have to be able to win elections. And there's only two ways to do that. We either have to have people that will play to the masses and say what they want to be, uh, you know, say what they want to hear or somehow titillate them or be a great showman or something like that so that people will vote for them on rather selfish or, or really rather uh, blight uh, hearted ideals, or we can hope we have leaders that will inspire us to reach in our souls and change where we are to where we should be. That's it. As a, as a person running for office, I can either <laughs> play to the popularity or somehow try to say something that will inspire people to where either my folks will turn out disproportionately or it will convert some of those that weren't on our side before. That's it. You know, uh, my background's engineering. Einstein said that uh, make things as simple as you can, but no simpler. 
Sometimes we have to boil it down into the basics. And right now, the basics are we've got to win the next election. It is vital because everything that uh, FRC has done will be affected by that if we lose. The Constitution itself will, will be underwater. Now, I know that that's a, that's a heavy thing, but I am convinced that we've been here before. You know, there was a time when the shadow of the swastika almost fell across the whole planet. And America, even though we were late, as Winston Churchill said, Americans always do the right thing after they've tried everything else. Uh, they exhausted every other possibility. We, we finally got involved and we did what was necessary to prevail. And if we hadn't, you know, we wouldn't be here. So, I mean, it's not, it's not a light question. And so now this generation has to respond. And I'm convinced that the great battle of this generation is whether or not we see the most innocent of all human beings uh, as being created in the image of God or not. And the real question about abortion, whenever you're dis debating it, there's really two that are of great consequence. Is there really a God? And are these really babies? Because if both of those things are true, the implications are pretty sobering, uh, even to our friends on the left. So with that, let me just say to you the strategies of some of the things that we're dealing with now, and I'll throw it open for questions if there's still time. I, I, the big challenges now are defunding Planned Parenthood, uh, passing protective legislation like the Born Alive legislation or the Pain Capable legislation, doing everything that we can to uh, raise up the specter of what's real here so that we can overcome what I call the, the abortion president uh, and somehow turn the country back on a, uh, in a place where we recognize and real, realize that these are, are little babies. Because if these are babies, the implication is pretty clear. If these really are babies, then you and I, all of us, Americans living in the land of the free and the home of the brave, are also living in the midst of the greatest human genocide in the history of humanity. That's pretty heavy. So uh, this is not something to, to pass off lightly and say, oh, well, you know, there's a lot of things I can get involved in. I know there are. But if we don't have the courage to protect these little babies, if we don't have the, the, the imp impulse and the determination to protect them, I promise you we will never sustain the determination or the impulse or to protect any kind of liberty for anyone. It will all go by the wayside. And if there's a God, I don't, I don't really have to, to elaborate, do I? Um, the last time he cleaned this place up, there's only eight folks left. And so that's a pretty, <laughs> I, that probably should, should be taken out of the tape. But, uh, uh, <laughs> but um, we, we have an opportunity here. So uh, we've gotten all of these bills in the system, all of which are important. Now here's something of uh, a structural nature that I hope you'll all remember. If it weren't for the Senate filibuster, we could pass every last one of these bills in a week and we would do so. With the present leadership, the present makeup of the House and the Senate, that would happen. That's a fact. But with the filibuster, we are in an incredibly challenging scenario to even pass one, any of them. The, the Senate filibuster is the culprit. And you say, well, why is he pounding that so hard? Because the debate today is, well, we got weak leadership. We got, and, and I'm considered one of the most conservative members of the House. I promise you, uh, I will step away from any leader that doesn't stand for these little babies. But that's really not our problem right now, even though that's the whole discussion out there, and in, inside the House even. The problem is, what happens is, we'll send a bill. Let me, give you, let me break this down here for you, and I'll throw it up for questions very soon, I promise. Look at the, uh, the bill on the Department of Homeland Security. We passed that bill in the House, funded it completely, and then sent it over. The, but we, we held out one thing, which was the President's Unconstitutional Act on Immigration. And we sent it over. That was our Article I powers of the purse. This was not something that was an overreach. This is something fully within our constitutional purview. We sent it over there, and the Senate says, no, we're not voting on it. You guys are shutting the government down. No, we're not voting on it. You guys are shutting the government down. Because they know they have developed shutdown of the government to the point now where it takes all the air out of the room. And now that's what Democrats now want. They, they, this an, it's an inducement to them, not a deterrent. The best they can hope for in these debates is to drag us into a government shutdown. That's the best they can hope for. 
because that's what they want. They know they can't defeat us on an up or down debate. They can't defeat us on the actual terms of the discussion. So they want to dist distract, and they're very, very good at it. I'd say that they use verbal gymnastics and uh, monotonic polysyllabic obfuscations and verbal circumlocution, all of those things to try to change where we're headed. So where we can't really focus the mind of the people who don't really look at this all the time. And uh, yet I still, as I say, hope that now that Planned Parenthood uh, has been exposed as they have, that we have a chance. The reason that we've discussed the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act is because I believe it might be a bill that could like, actually break, David, the, the Senate filibuster. Because now the senators are not saying, well, you know, I'm not sure that we're going to win them on the, on the basis of compassion. But now they can say, man, this would look pretty horrible in a campaign commercial that I voted against a bill or even allowing a bill to be voted on that would protect born alive little babies. Barack Obama voted against it four times. And then he called all of you liars because we told on him in the last election. And the media never did expose that. This bill will do that. And it puts him in a conundrum that I've never seen a president in my life in terms of if, if you have any concern about what your real legacy is and your eternal perspective is. But the, the reality is that uh, he doesn't want this on his desk. They will press these Democrats to filibuster, but I think it's going to be hard for them to do that. And this is going to go forward tomorrow. It has a lot of the same components that the pain-capable bill had that we voted out of the House. And the pain-capable bill is also extremely powerful because... The vast call for these little body parts of these little babies is for the older babies, for the more mature babies. And uh, that's the ones that pain capable protects. Starting at the beginning of the sixth month of gestation through the nine months, that's the ones that this, this bill protects. So it is a direct answer to this issue. And yet we haven't I've talked more about funding, which as you all have heard, probably heard my quote, I was upset and I said the sands, of ca the sands of time ought to blow over this Capitol Dome before we ever give Planned Parenthood one more dime of taxpayer dollars. And I believe that with everything in me. But if we focus just on funding, we need to, it's, not, it's not just the, the body part thing that's so horrible. It's horrible beyond words because it shocks our sensibilities. But you know what the real horrible is? It's that they kill these babies first. Sometimes they don't even wait till they're dead. That's the real horror here, and we need to speak directly to that issue because if we defunded Planned Parenthood tomorrow, I think that the, the, their evil index is such that they would continue to do what they're doing. We need to make it so that when doctors kill these little helpless, innocent, pain-capable human beings, that they go to jail uh, as long as they, we can possibly keep them there. And uh, uh, that's, that's in keeping with our constitutional foundation. So I'm going to stop there and throw it open for questions and thank you david for uh, you know, being so patient here yes sir in the back dustin siggins life site news two questions one did you indicate that there's a vote on a new bill tomorrow that's not the original pancake bill bill that's correct a lot of people may not know that i had suggested to to house leadership and it's just absolutely dumbfounded me that they listened uh, I, I suggested that, to them that we vote on an expansion of Born Alive legislation. And what that does, it requires that appropriate care be given to any child who survives an attempted abortion. You might, th for a minute, you might think, well, that's no big deal, but it's a big deal. It would place in, uh, strong criminal penalties uh, for violating this requirement, which there is none now. Uh, and it would establish a right of civil action uh, to, to the mother to enforce the law. Now, that's a big deal because Barack Obama voted against that legislation or that type of legislation four times. It didn't have the right of private action. It didn't have some other things in it. But the reason he gave to doing it is because he was afraid that it would impart constitutional personhood to the unborn child. And let me tell you, he may have a small point. Because how do you even the twisted left, how do you make the argument that a five-month child born alive, kicking, crying, born alive. If you take that child's life deliberately, you go to prison uh, for murder. But on the other hand, the same exact child, the same exact development, the same exact age, not yet born, if you kill that child deliberately, you've advanced the cause of freedom of choice and you get paid for it. That's a conundrum for them. They understand that, and they understand that as we go, as people understand this more and more and more, 
that they're going to say, wait a minute, what, what are we doing? The king is, na- the emperor is naked. Uh, and there comes a time when he walks right up on you that you finally realize it, you know. And uh, that, that's, that's what's happening here. I don't mean to, you know, I'm just saying that sometimes you just, it has to be blatant before they get a hold of it. And this is our chance, I believe, to press that. But probably the most significant thing about the bill is it can break that filibuster that I've been talking about. Because that filibuster is our monster. And as a movement, if we do not expose and put this filibuster right up there in the lights as high as we can so that we can put the pressure on the Democrats that are using it and at least make them accountable for using it the way they do, then we'll continue to lose. And I mean, those are heavy words. We've got to do that. You know, if you want, you know, in engineering, if you figure out what the problem is, if you say, okay, we, the, we trip or we break this shaft every time, this is where, no matter what we do, here's where it always breaks, then you have to make that different. You have to engineer that different. And the filibuster right now is where we're always breaking down. And what it does then is it makes the House leadership look weak. It makes us, and, and then we're all af- wanting to go after John Boehner. Um, and I understand, you know, people have their opinions. I'm not here to try to, to be a, an advocate for anybody. What I am here to say is that our frustration should be focused on the real culpable issue. And ultimately, that's Barack Obama, ultimately, because he's the one that's put us all in this completely surreal dynamic to where he tries to convince his Senate Democrat supporters to filibuster so he won't have to deal with an issue. And, and he is so far to the left that he frustrates everybody. We see the whole world on fire. We see all these things. We see little babies being uh, slaughtered and, and, and killed for their parts. And we see all these ugly things. And he's the guy that holds the antithetical view to us in terms of how we should respond to it. So then he uses the political process in a way that frustrates everyone. And then our anger gets so bad, we just want an outlet. And so if we don't understand what the real problem is, we hit the closest person to us. And that's what's happening. As a a follow-up, when it comes to the upcoming um, budget vote, you you referenced the discussions in the House. Uh, Senator McConnell in early August said that Republicans will not be responsible for shutting the government down. Uh, Representative Black has come out and said Senator McConnell needs to at least try, quote, at least try to push more aggressive language into the into the budget. Uh, the can you, CR. Can, CR. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to strategy, why aren't House and Senate leaders, and I don't know if you can speak for the Senate leaders, but House and Senate leaders, why aren't they pushing every possible trick, every possible legislative strategy, every possible educational strategy for the public, as you've referenced earlier, that it needs to happen to get past the filibuster? Well, no, I think that's the right question. And uh, and I think to a large degree they are. It's just there's, a, there's only a couple that they haven't employed. And, I, and that my suggestion was that we moved forward on this Born Alive bill, which they are doing. And that's going to be voted on tomorrow, and I appreciate it. And then to, to put the fight over Planned Parenthood funding in the reconciliation battle, which I believe they're going to do. And now that means that we won't have the filibuster. It's the one mechanism that we have to avoid the filibuster. So did, have I mentioned anything about this filibuster yet? <laughs> uh, because, see, it helps us get around that. That's the only reason that it's a worthwhile mechanism. It only does one thing. It compli- it's more difficult than any other defunding mechanism, but it has one really cool feature, is it's not subject to filibuster. And so I hope that that's the battle we fight. I hope that somehow we can communicate with the base well enough to know that there are some of us that would give our lives to protect these babies. And uh, it's not a matter of commitment. It, we just need a way to do it. And the only way I can really give you this feeling that people like me have is to say, why did you all elect Barack Obama? You see, you didn't. How many of you voted for Barack Obama? You see, n- yeah, yeah. No, no one in the room did. You didn't vote for him. But unfortunately, you got outvoted. And that's happening to me in the House of Representatives. People like me get outvoted or we, we uh, don't get a vote in the Senate because of the filibuster. Making sense here to you at all? All right, next question. Uh, Congressman Franks, um, you worked really hard earlier in the year on the, the five-month ban, the 20-week ban. Uh, it was supposed to be voted on, uh, scheduled for a vote on the, the, the March for Life, what, January 22nd? eventually got there. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, kind of the, the work that uh, you did and, and pro-life uh, members did and then, uh, you know, 
we're going to see a vote in the Senate um, potentially next week and, and a way forward. You just want to comment on that? Well, as you know, um, the bill was scheduled to be voted on January 22nd, the, the anniversary of Roe versus Wade. And some of our own people um, challenged the way that it was being done. And it's unfortunate because in the end, um, they, they changed their position. Uh, we were trying to do, I think we had as good a, uh, an opportunity as we could have at that point. But the good news is whenever you lose, it's very important rather than giving up. And we don't have the luxury of giving up. I mean, you know, we, it's not over till, till that big trumpet sounds, you know. Um, we don't have the right to give up. So what we did, we went back behind closed doors, and in this case uh, mostly it was uh, Joe Pitts and, and Chris Smith and myself. And we just hammered on this thing to try to figure out some way. It seemed like an impossible thing. It seemed like another one of these conundrums. But we were able to actually strengthen the bill tremendously, even though they got some, some things they wanted. We had a stronger bill when we got done than we had in the beginning, and that's the truth. If, if the average abortionist, when he looks at pain capable, if that's in place, he's out of his mind to do a late-term abortion because he's subject to lawsuits, subject to everything. If the slightest thing goes wrong, and even if, even if it doesn't, uh, he, he's really in a, in a bind. So we ended up getting a better bill. It did pass the House. And now it's in the Senate. It's come out of committee, and it's going to be voted on Tuesday. And uh, I will tell you that the one thing that will stop it in the Senate is what? Yeah. I think we may fall short about three votes on that. So it's a big one. And if we have any opportunity to tell the world that the Senate Democrats will not even allow a bill that would protect babies beginning at the sixth month, forward to be even debated on to be even voted on to be even discussed you know it was ironic that there was a time in about 18 i think 1836 somebody can look it up where they passed a rule in the house that you couldn't debate or discuss slavery because they didn't want to deal with that reality see and so that's what they're really doing in the senate they, they don't want to debate or discuss it because it does not work well with them. The pain capable bill has about 60 percent support starting out. But then you look at the people who say, no, I don't support it. Ten percent of those say it doesn't go far enough. So you got about 70 percent support. And when people understand it, it goes to 84 percent. Ronald Reagan used to say, you know, stand beside an 80 percent issue and smile. Politically, we should not be afraid of this. Now, for people like me, it wouldn't matter the politics. It really wouldn't if it could be done. But uh, we have that opportunity now, and we need to pound on the filibuster because if that bill goes to the president's desk, he will probably veto it. And then here's what happens. Now, is this, is this, for, the whole, is this for the whole world, David? Okay, so I need to be somewhat uh, aware of that, don't I? <laughs> uh, just, just suggest to you that that could help us do the one prime objective for the pro-life cause that we must have. And what did I say that was? That's to win the next presidency. That's the most important thing we can do for these little babies is to win the next presidency. And if we debate bills like this that give us a clear net advantage in the election, in the last time, in the last election, pain capable, you know, was passed once before in the House, and it became an issue in six Senate races um, that we won. Uh, SBA says that, that we had our margin of victory was because of the pain capable in all of those. But I know for sure it was in two or three of them. And I think it could be in the presidential election. And uh, so this is not just about the moment. This is about trying to build a favorable position for the presidential election. You tell me what we're doing time-wise here. I think it's good on time. Okay, good on time. Yes, sir. Yes. I just want to get okay. Recording, so. Okay. Josh Shepard with Bound for Life. Um, on the pain capable bill, this seems to introduce a new uh, paradigm to consider a baby's viability. Mm -hmm. Wondering if you could talk about the science that undergirds this bill. Yeah. Well, uh, the bill has a lot of findings. As you know, uh, scientifically, we literally uh, were very conservative. Uh, beginning at the sixth month, we know the baby feels pain earlier than that. And that's very hard for me as a sponsor of that bill that we leave some of those that. You know, leave any of them out. But, but the truth is, it's incontrovertible at that point. 
Uh, no person except someone that's just a demagogue or a liar or a complete moron. Forgive me. I don't want to. I wanna, we always have to include all the possibilities. Um, um, will truly debate that a child feels pain beginning at the sixth month. There's no. There's no debate about that. And so we had to to get there because if we win there, then we have a better chance of leveraging that to win to protect the earlier ones. So. Um, Again, the hope is that we can humanize the child to the extent that people will really know what we're talking about. Because I, th I think that there's still a remnant of, uh, not a remnant, I think there's a, a, a majority of Americans don't like the idea of killing little babies uh, torturously and painfully without anesthetic. They don't like that. Uh, and the day they do is the day that we, we've all lost uh, our, our, our battle. So. Um, I don't know if I fully answered the question, uh, but I, I hope that uh, we can paint this in the minds of people clearly. Because in this case, all we need, all we need is people to know the truth. In fact, that's the whole ball game here. If we can help people know the truth about these little babies and what happens to them, uh, what Planned Parenthood is doing to them, uh, this thing will be won. Uh, we, will, we will win this. Their only hope, and they've been very good at it, is to demagogue the issue, to hide from it. You know, when we hear about baby seals, we see them being clubbed in the snow. Uh, when we hear about all the other kinds of things, you know, we, we see all the realities, the, uh, the ugliness of the war or something like that. But it's about abortions, people carrying signs in front of abortion clinics. They never really focus on the real issue. And that is, does abortion kill a child? If it doesn't, I promise you, if somebody could convince me that abortion doesn't kill a child, I'll quit talking about it tomorrow. Because it's not about the surgery, it's not about the control, it's not about it. It's about one thing. It's about protecting innocent little children of God. And if we don't do that, then it diminishes all of us to the extent that I think we failed our purpose for living. Yes, sir. Um, when it comes to winning the presidential election, a lot of pro-life activists, grassroots advocates, they have seen Republicans promise things when they won the House, if they won the House in 2010, mm -hmm. if they win the Senate in 2014. Now Senator McConnell, um, among others, including yourself, saying that the next, the president, we have to win the presidency. Why should the Republican pro-life base trust Republicans in light of what appears to be broken promises in the recent past, as well as the growth in Planned Parenthood funding and other yeah. uh, issues under President Bush when the GOP controlled Congress? Yeah. Well, uh, your, your point is a good one, but let me just suggest to you that, first of all, Republicans shouldn't make promises that they can't keep. Uh, in this case, with the filibuster and a Democrat president, we were foolish to make promises, uh, and I certainly didn't make those promises. I, I promised to try, and we have. But to make promises that you can overcome the laws of mathematics uh, is, a, is a false promise. Uh, and yet, at the same time, the American people should say, okay, if we don't trust the Republicans, let's look at what's happening here. Is it them, or is it, the, is it this filibuster this Franks guy keeps talking about? What is it really the problem? Because if it is them, them let's take them out in the primary. And that's the place to take them out is the primary. People say, well, if um, you know, I'm, I'm going to step outside my uh, normal genteel bounds here just for a second. I was on Fox here a couple years ago before the last presidential election. And they asked me, because I was supporting someone other than Mr. Romney at the time. Not He's a good guy, but he, they, I was supporting someone else. And they said, well, you're going to support whoever the nominee is, aren't you? And I said, absolutely. And they said, even if it's Ron Paul? I said, even if it's RuPaul. <laughs> Some of you got that. For those of you who didn't get that, I'm really proud of you. Because uh, I, I, I never met this guy. But the point is, um, you know, we have to have a better answer. If we say, well, the Republicans, how can we trust them? They made these promises. Uh, they probably overpromised to win because they, they, they shouldn't have done that. But the bottom line is, are you going to trust a Democrat instead? Are you going to trust a Barack Obama? The truth is, a lot of us are really trying. And this filibuster has stopped us on the legislative level. And as you know, when you have a president like uh, Barack Obama, he uses the leverage to affect the process. And all I can say is, Vote for the Mike Huckabee of your choice and make sure that you, no, he, he's my guy. But, uh, but I, I will support whoever the nominee is, and he knows that, and he will too. Um, and let's make sure that we hold their feet to the fire the best we can. But we need to do something about this filibuster. And I think that uh, Mr. McConnell should say, hey, no, wait a minute. 
Harry Reid did the nuclear option to get a few judges uh, confirmed. Now we've got Iran, and we are either going to do the nuclear option in the Senate on behalf of America, or Iran's going to use the nuclear option themselves against America someday. And when we don't care enough about these little babies to stop this filibuster, if it's in our power to do it, then we're failing. So there, again, is, the, is, the, is the, where the focus of the energy should be. And I would say that you'd have a case uh, if we don't stop the filibuster. And a lot of people will say, well, but if you do that, then the Democrats, when they're in control. But ladies and gentlemen, they are so good at hiding the truth anyway. Let's make them accountable. Let's make them own what they do. Uh, because that's the only hope we have anyway. We have, to, we have to somehow put this in people's minds clearly. And uh, I know it's dangerous. But what's, what's more dangerous, just stalemate or at least having an exercise in, in a debate and an open discussion where the truth can finally emerge. And so that's why I'm so committed to it. Yes, ma'am. How are you? Representative Franks, thank you for being here. Uh, my question is, um, you know, the White House is opposing the uh, Born Alive bill, and because of what they say is it, quote unquote, interferes with uh, the patient, doctor-patient relationship, uh, would they support Gosnell, and how do we answer their argument? Well, if they're against this bill, there's no purpose that Gosnell's in prison. You know, there's no reason for him to be there. Uh, the truth is, once the child's born alive, we can make a lot of arguments, but you can no longer m make the argument that his interests and the mother's interests are still entangled. At that point, they're, se they're separate human beings. They're still separate human beings, but I mean, it's clear to everybody that once the child's born alive, it, it, it's hard for anybody to argue otherwise. The reason the president is hoping that this doesn't come to his desk, he's issued a veto threat, and I hope that we can take him up on that and make him veto this bill. I'm not sure he will veto it. He may let it become law without his signature. I doubt very seriously that he would ever sign the bill, which would kind of put a little pall on it if he did, you know. Uh, but the, the, the bottom line is that uh, he's trying to stop it in the, in the Senate and use every leverage that he has, which is considerable. And you ought to see, though, that there's a little different message to his fill, to his. Uh, a veto message than it is on the others. On the others, it says the president's advisors will advise him to veto this bill if it comes. On this one, it says the president will veto it. I don't think the advisors would even wanted to be part of it. Uh, so we need to make sure that this bill gets to his desk. And the one way that we can do that is to stop the filibuster. Whatever it takes, we have to stop the filibuster. And the way that we need to do that is to somehow, I think, make sure that these Democrats, the one way for sure that we can do it is make sure these Democrats are so aware that they are going to be accountable for this vote now, not only in eternity, but in the next election, uh, that they somehow consider that it's better for them politically because they may not, we may not be able to win the debate on, on the moral uh, impulse on it. So, yeah, I, did I answer your question very well? Did I? I don't, you look like you're not sure. You want any, any elaboration? <laughs> Sometimes I take off and I apologize. All right, well, let's thank Congressman Franks for being here. Thank All you right. so much. My son had a question. <laughs> just, just, just for a laugh, I want to I wanna see what his question was. Didn't you say that Dr. Kermit Gosnell couldn't find his way out the bathroom? Uh, something like that, buddy boy. He's not a very nice guy. He's not a very nice guy. All right, God bless you folks. Thank you very much.